Good morning, New Eden. Today is January 22nd, 2023, and this is the Federation Frontline Report. I'm your host, Frozen Fallout, and my co-host is Night Flyer. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining the show. And today we will be interviewing Alexiv um, Card, leader of the Network Alliance. How's it going, Alex? Oh. How's treat, uh, space treating you? It's treating me pretty well. Thanks for having me on again, guys. Yeah, no, and there's a lot going on in the world of Noir lately. Um, I hear that there's a lot of new corporations, well, not necessarily new corporations, but corporations that have existed for a while, some of them newer, some of them uh, quite a, quite old uh, faction warfare corporations um, that have recently joined the network. Can you tell me a little bit about your uh, new members? Yeah, we've merged with the alliance briefly known as Wubba Lubba Dub Dub, uh, aka Horngree and QCATS, Quantum Cat Syndicate. We have opened the doors to the network for them as equal partners, and we're now one big happy family. Awesome. Awesome. So, uh, how has uh, Faction Warfare been going for the network? Okay, you guys are going pretty strong. Uh, you guys still on contract, or...? Uh, the contract for Faction Warfare ended. We actually took another one within the Faction Warfare context against Test fairly recently. That went well, um, but we're not on contract at the moment. Uh, always looking for more. We're still a mercenary alliance, and in fact, the corps that we've recruited through Faction Warfare, we still are going to take them sometimes on contracts with us, particularly if they feel like it or if we really need the help. Um, but we have a long-term home now in Faction Warfare, and so everything about this move made sense for us. It gives us a little more firepower to bring on contracts when we want it or need it. And when we're not doing contracts, we have a really awesome place to keep our members happy and fighting and generally enjoy a different style of PvP than we would otherwise get. Awesome, and you guys are living out of the northern area um, of uh, Faction Warfare, is that correct? Over like by Aldernet, uh, like OICX area type kind of stuff? Uh, we're in Hade, wherever that's considered. North, west, somewhere in there. Yeah, Hadeelis, uh, Hadeelis would be... So if you guys are in Hadei uh, less, then, then you're in the south. That would definitely, according to like the, the in-game map type of setup that they have for us because um, there seems to be like a really great divide between um, I don't know why I thought that you guys were in the north I thought you'd be, were you guys assisting in like the OICX kind of stuff that was going on we were yeah for a, okay. a little while but with this merger I think it made more sense to have everybody in the same spot and Hade is where QCATS and Horngree were based out of mm -hmm. so as part of this once our test contract was done um, for that, we staged in Hallinan, which is kind of right in the middle of the two. We just It was just as easy for us to move from Hallinan to Hade as it was from Hallinan back to Blue Warrior, so we decided to go that route. Okay, yep, that definitely makes sense. Um, yeah, we have, been, we have been bouncing around a lot of Faction Warfare, which has made fun for logistics, which is why, like, my Lashak is way out of place from where I need it to be right now. <laughs> So tell me, um, what has I, I've been hearing some rumors that there's some some in uh, inner turmoil inside of the Galente recently uh, regarding something about a line member uh, of, of network that pissed off somebody, and that there was some some fighting that was going on, or just like something that was happening between network and, and some other organization. I was hearing rumors about this so maybe they're not substantiated because i haven't talked to you guys at all about this but uh if it happened it was low enough level i never heard about it <laughs> okay <laughs> um but yeah so uh definitely um really looking you know forward to seeing what ccp is going to be doing uh moving forward with faction warfare um and what uh, what are your plans currently with with faction warfare for your organization right now? Though are you guys planning on just building? Because now you you've got a bunch of structures, right? Is that uh, or Hungry used to or owns all of like 
Hades, right? Has a bunch of big structures yeah. and stuff like that. Um, so is that is that a setup where? Because I mean, obviously, you're making some kind of deal with Snuff in order to prevent them from blowing your stuff up, or you have some kind of backer that's being able to, per, you know, persuade Snuff not to want to go blow up your stuff. But most of the time, people aren't able to hold anything in these areas. Is that something? Is that uh, something you might be able to talk about a little bit? I am going to have to shill for my own podcast here. If you want all the details about Snuff's relationship to Galenti Militia and Kaldari Militia and the structures contained therein, uh, check out one of the more recent episodes of Declarations of War where we have Nix Aeon and Hendrik Suzaku on, and they really get into it. <laughs> oh, interesting. What's the what's that episode? Uh, let me look that up real quick. I'd say 247, but I might be wrong. Yeah, it's from about a month ago, but it is um, heated. I'll put it heated. Two forty-five. Two forty-five. The Cal the Calgal Summit is a fascinating look at the the higher level political interactions between the different warfare groups, and Snuff gets an extended mention. Interesting. Okay, so I'll, I'll also include that into the show notes here. Um, make sure that that's something that our viewers can go check out. Uh, would you be able to give us maybe just like a little brief summary concept of, of what's kind of going on with that? Uh, the short version is Kaldari believes that Galenti has some kind of snuff agreement. Nyx swears he doesn't, but he is not friends with would be the wrong word, but does have some history and relationship with them. Acquaintances. Uh, yeah, most recently Snuff has been very active helping Kaldari militia. So, uh, you know, whatever his uh, relationship with them isn't that good, clearly. Um, but at the same time, I think Snuff is keenly aware that factual warfare drives a lot of their content, and they're not in a hurry to destabilize the critical infrastructure of the militias. They want to farm the structures for kills. So they'll reinforce stuff on the peripheries, which they have done and less so, you know, headshot the market and that kind of thing. Interesting. You're saying that Snuff has been helping out uh, the Keldari lately. Um, in, in what way do you feel that they've been assisting Keldari? Uh, very directly. They've been helping them plex, especially in Halonin and the surrounding area there. They have been uh, reinforcing some Glenty militia structures. They've been securing grids for them so they can take IHUBs with their fleets and dreadnoughts. So they've been fairly active the past few weeks. Interesting. Oh, I, I, I haven't uh, personally run into stuff in the plexing area, but I definitely see like the uh, you know messing with high eye hubs and stuff like that. And is that is it possible that it's being misconstrued that they're directly helping the Keldari? Is there any like solid information regarding that, or is it just uh, from a parent point of view? You know, from the from no, what it looks been like. directly fighting at least a subset of snuff and plexes for several weeks. Oh uh, wow! So over in the the Hallinan area, you're saying it's been uh, yeah pretty strong, and that's Hallinan. Uh, uh, what's the one next to it? Nenamalia. So yeah, there's... that area, Pinacasto. Um, yeah, so we have Pinacasto, uh, Huri, Get my map out. Huri, uh, Rakapa, uh, Rakapuspus, which is the um, area that the um, mostly is well known as being the snuff system, you know, like yeah. Rakapas. They've been active helping them because Kaldari had gotten pushed. Uh, we had put severe pressure on Halonin. Pinacasto had fallen. Hikokin had fallen. And now that is all retaken, and the way that Kaldari was able to pull that off was in large part due to Snuff's direct help. Interesting, yeah, because yeah, we had pushed in pretty strong, um, and, and now we're losing out on the northern front as well. We just lost OICX not too long ago, um, and Vivalier is under assault now, but Vivalier looks like it's holding out pretty strong, um, although Alderneti is looking like it's going to be falling maybe at some point here. Looks like advantage is pretty strong uh, for both sides. Keldari only has a 1% advantage, but they both have like um, yes, 80, so 94% for the Keldari, 93% for the um, Galente at this point for advantage in that system. Um, so 
lots of fighting going on there. Do you find that now um, that you're down in the south over in Hadili's area, trying to get over to Nenemelia, Aldrinetti, and the like being uh, a problem because of Hakukin at all? Um, or are all of your members pretty strongly good with the Triglavians? You don't have to deal with the Triglavian gate camp that happens in Hakukin all the time. Uh, so, sorry, I forgot the key up. Yeah, it was definitely an issue uh, initially. We had a lot of members that just didn't mind their uh, their Triglavian standings, but it became very apparent operationally that we needed to fix that. So we had a lot of standings fleets heading into Pacha to try to get those standings up. I think at this point, most of our members, at least the ones at Noir and Noir Academy, are all set. But yeah, it's... It's annoying. It's definitely a unique geographical feature that, that played a fairly big role. Moving through that system was tough, and Kaldari Militia would often camp it to make it even tougher. So that was definitely a pretty important facet of the campaign. Yeah, I've, I've definitely found that uh, getting everybody good with the Triglavian that I run into, and whenever I run like a, a open fleet with people, it's uh, there's always going to be a few people that are having problems Triglavians. Now, sometimes it's not camped, which is kind of nice. You know, you like you, you just send somebody in, like myself or a lot of other people that are usually in my fleet, to go check it out. But it, if if it is a blockage, um, it's like like thirteen jumps that you have to do in order to go around, which is extremely, um, you know, just time delay, you know, and annoying to have to go all the way around the war zone and into the back area in order to actually get up. And yeah, it's extremely inconvenient, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, although, when we were staging in Vlil, it wasn't so bad. Um, you would just do one of the other systems, like go through Enaluri to get to Halanum, which was our main focus for that campaign. Yeah, so if, uh, I mean, right now, basically, uh, Hukukin is one of these systems that is what seems to really break the north and south of, of the war zone, from what I've seen. Uh, you know, because there is no way besides going all the way around and go up to Mirathan, then Mezivir, then Orville, then Uli, and then you're back into the war zone area and you can get into like the northern part of the war zone. But other than that, um, there is the high sec gate that uh, the Kaldari have that get them directly in uh, over from uh, Saren or Sam Unin. And uh, that'll get you over to Athenon. Um, but the Galente don't have a way of really getting up into the north without going the long way around or taking the Kukin, which the you know, is strongly a Triglavian system. So, and that kind of makes, like, I feel like that really separates the war zone from the north to the south. Um, and I've been hearing that there's there's been some anger about the, how much we haven't been pushing the north. Um, because the north is, you know, there was a long fight in OICX. Um, it took a long time, but it finally did fall. Um, and there wasn't as much help from the southern alliances, from what I hear. Um, you were involved in, in some of that. Do, do you feel that that's... Uh, warranted or valid complaint that the, the South pushed their own agendas down in the South more than wanting to help with OICX? Uh, I think it's true, but I don't think it's a valid complaint, if that makes any sense. Um, you know, it's a, it's a big war zone. Kaldari pushing one system doesn't mean there's not fighting happening elsewhere. The fighting in Oiks have been going on for a very long time, nor at one point deployed up to help shore that up. But the fighting down in Hasmajala, Nagamanan, like those systems were all getting pushed as well. The southern mm -hmm. groups were down there doing their best to hold the line. The northern groups had to be up in the north and hold the line up there. You know, it had to be a combined arms effort. It couldn't be just focusing on one point versus the other. And we'll say that the southern groups are more disparate and weaker. The, the top was anchored by Sedition, which is a large, cohesive alliance that's very PvP-oriented, 
and they were, you know, supplied with logistics and supplied with ISK and supplied with ships from some of the southern groups, Horngry in particular. But Horngry didn't have the pilots to spare. So every group's trying to help out as best they can. I think if you are complaining that the rest of the groups aren't focusing on the system that only you care about, that's kind of a missing the forest for the trees view of the faction warfare landscape, in my view. Mm -hmm. And I know that, I mean, with the changes, it's not as important to hold space unless you want to live there. Uh, and even and, if you... and it's also, there's no, like, defining thing. It's not like there was a timer for Wakes, where it right. was, everybody needs to turn up here on this night or we're going to lose it. It's a gradual yes. thing that took place over the course of many, many weeks. Yeah, you spend, can't expect spend months, to you know, working. Months. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's one of the topics we talked about a couple weeks ago uh, when someone asked about the organization of the militias. And, you know, it's not like we have a war room where all the heads of corps get together and make decisions of what our strategic plan moving forward should be. Um, you know, I think there's those individual corps, what's good for my corp, what's good for my alliance, and uh, well, as you pointed out, try. if space isn't important to you, then why fight for it? They, they kind of yeah. try, I mean, it, it, there's like a director's channel where all the heads of the alliances chat with each other, but there's no, there's never any expectation since I've had eyes in that channel that everyone gets on the same page all the time. There's definitely alliances that want to have certain things usually based on where they're living like if you're living in Blil obviously Oix is the number one thing for you but if you're living in Adelis or Nagamanen like that's a pretty remote concern you know you want to make sure that your territory is defended and that you're taking the targets that are close to you and yeah there's some shuffling around if there's a big push from Kaldari in any one place but if they're pushing three four or five different systems You've got to prioritize somehow, and oftentimes it is the uh, closest available, and that's fairly normal and okay, I think. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that that's. I mean, we don't even have. We don't. We have the director's channel, but we don't have like monthly meetups or even meetings. Right. You know, there's at no all. like strategy planning sessions of any kind. Right. Yeah. There's no. You know, no sitting down with the heads of the the, the alliances getting together a conceptual plan of I mean it's kind of like every man do what you're doing and get out there flex um, and there is less need for that I think in this environment without the the tier system and the idea of you know trying to flip the war zone back over to tier 5 for you or whatever who needs to like put their LP into what um, you know I hubs and stuff like that in order to boost up stuff and to make sure that you know, we're keeping a tier two or tier three or tier four or whatever. Um, you you also don't need to worry much about where other people live. Yeah, very true. It doesn't super matter at the end of the day. I mean, taking any individual system doesn't really matter at the end of the day, unless, like you said, you live there. Kaldari controlling 50 systems versus 60 systems has no advantage for them and no disadvantage for Galenti. Right, yeah, and it's it's one of those things. So, is that something though that you feel is good? Do you do you think that CCP should reinstitute something that makes us care about the different, um, you know, how many systems that we own, um, and if there's anything that could be done to make it to actually matter how much of the war zone that you're controlling? I think it should be. I. I don't love the idea of the old tier system, don't want to bring that back. There should be no... There shouldn't have to be some kind of meta-math around deliberately losing the war to make it worth your, worth your while, in other words. So whatever it is, I don't think it should be LP. Uh, but I do think that you should care whether your side is winning or not beyond just the immediate fights that you're getting, and I think that that should translate into systems, because that's what the whole thing is about. So the if more you... systems that you own, the more that you're technically winning. Right, and that should confer something material. 
it shouldn't be the kind of thing that changes in value whether you're winning the most or the little. I don't know if that's like both sides get the same resource, but you get a different quantity if you're on the winning side. I don't know if it's maybe something more uh, intangible, uh, something that you can't sell on the market, like maybe it's the the new Evermarks currency that's used oh. for cosmetics, perhaps. But I think there should be some kind of advantage, whether you're holding 25 systems or 50, beyond saying that you're holding 50 of them. Yeah, I think that there's a... It's it's an interesting problem right now. Of, it, it's not too much of a problem from what I'm seeing. Like, it's not like we're just letting systems get taken over as, you know, as much... I mean, I guess there was some of that in the beginning. I feel like the Keldari in the beginning just, like, dropped out of the entire cell, basically. Like, um, we... Well, they fought back. We just beat them. Well, Old Man <laughs> Star was seemed like it just got abandoned almost immediately. But that's. I think that that also puts towards the idea that Hadeelis is always... If the Keldari own it, it will always be a frontline system, and you can't kick us out now. Hadeelis, Old Man Star, Fliette are all three southern systems that border a Galente um, high sec or low sec system that forces it to always be part of the either there it, it always makes it so that the Galente can dock. You can right. never kick us out of Old Man Star, whereas they had previously kicked us out of Old Man Star. Um, we could we couldn't dock in any of the uh, NPC stations and player-owned stations, we didn't get tethered. Um, and so that was a little bit rough. Um, do you think that there should be something that brings back some of the penalties um, for not owning the system, um, even if it is a frontline system, like like the tether? Because, um, like, right now, it, if, if you go to OICX, it, it, if you lived there, there's no difference that the Kaldari own it. Uh, besides if they destroyed a structure or something like that, but owning o OICX did nothing for them to kick anybody out of OICX. I'm, I'm fine with it. Um, I think you need a bit of rolling battlefield, and I think there's a... If you, if you disallow that on the front line, I think you are making it that much more difficult to contest the systems and fight over them. And it'll get a little too defender advantage. People won't be incentivized to be aggressive. I I think having the front lines be essentially equivalent to each other until you make it not a front line anymore is a pretty interesting and novel concept that CCP did. And from what I've experienced so far in the war zone, I think it's been a good move. I'd have to agree. I like that. Um, you know, if you're if you're in a front line system, you can dock. That's huge. Like and. It is really really nice to be able to handle uh you know putting logistics out there and stuff like that if i want to but then if you are setting up inside of a keldari system um and you put a bunch of assets into it or you do have um, stations that are in their frontline system it is at threat like if you if if the system that is owned by the galente gets taken over and that turns into a command operations system instead of a frontline system you are fully locked out besides your pod like and neutrals of course um i do think that it uh and i still don't think you can dock with your pod in an npc station and that's one thing that i i don't know if you've ever run into this though but uh one of the things that is really rough is the asset safety so if you ever have anything that goes into asset safety, that goes into a station that you can't dock, you can't get it. You can't touch it. There's nothing that you can do with that. No, your alt can't have it. Nobody can have it. Uh, because it's an asset safety item that you need to actually dock in the station and open up. There's no way to access that asset safety item. So if a Kaldari come in, you know, take the systems enough so that it, uh, whatever structure is now in a command post or, or a command operations or a backline system, and they destroy that um, Aster House or whatever, you know, any kind of upwell structure and any of that stuff that goes to asset safety, if it was owned by a Galente, 
they're not going to have access to that asset safety stuff until they get the ability to dock at that station. Yeah, which means if it's expensive enough and important enough, you might have to mount a campaign to frontline that system. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds like a good content driver to me. Uh, no, and I think that that's... So I think a lot of people um, kind of discounted to a certain degree some of the, the aspects because um, if you do get locked out of, of a system without asset safety, though, you can just give it over to your alt. Um, and so that that becomes a less of a conflict driver or, or yeah. a problem of having being locked out of a station. Um, that's a really hard problem for CCP to design around, though. Right, and that's, yeah, it's nearly impossible <laughs> to... I guess you could, like, disable trades and contracts in places where you're locked out. But, like, I guess that would actually be a pretty simple way to do it, but... Yeah, I, I'm guessing that would be a hard thing to code, though, that it would be specific to just... I mean, it's it's also spaghetti POS code that they're yeah, going to be using, <laughs> so, um, you know, who knows what the limitations they have on being able to restrict somebody's trading ability if they're in a Galente militia and it's in a uh, enemy system type kind of thing. But uh, the one thing, though, that I've always wondered about was, like, what, what could be done to make it so that owning systems actually is is good because um, like one of the things that we kind of lack right now i mean we have it to a small degree they give like uh what there's a tax reduction that you get right you get a um uh manufacturing i believe gets like a reduction in the cost of manufacturing for what tier mm -hmm. of a system that you have under your control um but this, it's not really big bonuses like you get out in 0.0. .0. Like 0.0, .0 has anomalies that you're able to um, actually like farm and get you know elk or get isk out of basically upgrading your space. The more you upgrade the space, the more that you can utilize it for mining and um, you know scanning. Is there anything that you think that should actually come that way to faction warfare? Oh, it just kind of ties back into the uh, what we were talking about as far as incentives for getting the more systems or more systems than your opponent could also be total number of systems. But I do think there should be something. I don't think it should be so overwhelming an advantage that uh, you know that y you can't come back from it. If they did push you back to say just Hades and Fleet, I wouldn't want to see that because that would be, you know, fundamentally unfun. But at the same time, it's got to be something, it's something that you can have. The discounts to the manufacturing stuff are, are great. That really helps groups that are in faction warfare being in that content, you know, putting themselves at risk. It's a nice little reward for them. But if you're not an industrialist, that's not giving you anything. <laughs> right, yeah, if you don't sell on the market, if you don't uh, build your own stuff, the, the bonus that they really give for upgrading the iHub of uh, a faction warfare system just really isn't, doesn't have much incentive there. Yeah. What do you think, Nightflyer? Is there anything that you could think of that might be cool to add to to bonuses that you would get from a system for upgrading it or owning more systems uh, i think you start running to a problem if you start changing it too much or twisting you're going to end up with the unintended consequences that uh, i think we kind of fell victim to before so i'm a little apprehensive about suggesting any major changes i think might be those little tweaks you could do with like industry or you know a, an extra percentage of mining or something like that um but i that'd be about it for me right now um but i think i would kind of keep things like this as long as we're kind of working and moving forward but well there's yeah, a I sense of it ain't broken don't question. fix it and i, I do think yeah. this is much better than the faction warfare used to be when we did have that kind yeah. of system that's true. No, and I think this is this is a big bump up from what we had. And and one of the things that um, I always kind of ask um, people that have been coming on recently, and just people I've been running into recently, is have you seen the the no uh, no fitting Dplex ship 
recent one. And I haven't run into like a single one. Now maybe I'm just not killing it because it gets off so quickly, but those things were the easiest to kill because usually it was, ah, I've got nothing in it, I'll just stick it into the defensive plex and go get a cup of, you know, soup or whatever, you know, <laughs> like, um... No, no, that makes sense though, as mechanically designed. I think defensive plexing is a little too easy. I don't have a great workaround for it though. I think it's pretty easy, but it's also um, not as rewarding. And depending on how much, I do like that the the um, the reward is based off of. Um, how contested the system is. So if you've got a, you know, the contested sy system is 0.1% contested, you get like one LP for doing uh, any flex basically as a defensive flex. Uh, but if it's 95% contested, it really incentivizes you to start going out in defensive flex. Mm. And so I think that that, that is healthy. Um, I've always kind of advocated for the idea of removing the concept of defense and offense and flex. That it shouldn't, there shouldn't be a difference between it. That the, the rat, there, uh, there should be two rats inside of every single flex. Um, and those two rats should be shooting at each other. Um, and they can't kill each other because their DPS sucks and their tank is pretty decent for the ship size that they are. Um, and when a player intervenes and kills one of the rats, then the, the flex starts, you know, going, basically. Um, and you don't need offense and defense in the system that we have. I think you need, you know, there's, I like the idea of off, or, uh, there's frontline systems and then there's, you know, command operation and backline systems. Um, but I don't think that there needs to be a difference between offensive and defensive flexing point that it can just all be basically offensive type kind you don't call it offensive defense anymore you just call it flexing you go in you have to kill a rat rat respawns after a while you've got to kill it again it stops the timer slows things down for a little bit but lp payout should be the same no matter whether you're doing offense or defense and you still have to do the killing of the rat um, which does prevent you from like one of the things you can do right now with defensive flexing is i can take my comet and I can go into an open and defensive flexing in a system that's 80% contested and get like 40,000 LP for just sitting there for 15 minutes. Right. And I can't do that if it was all offensive or it was all, you know, you gotta kill the rat or a rat that's in it. Um, because then I'd have to bring in, you know, a much bigger ship. So defensively, you can use a lot smaller ships in order to protect your land. Whenever you go offensive, you have to at least go with a group or you need to have, um, you know, a larger ship or a more DPS oriented ship, which can take away from your ability to be actually PvP. And I think there's a lot of PvP right now out there. Um, I mean, I think the numbers support that. Um, I think me, you know, personal experience is supporting that. What, what about you? Do you think that there's just a lot of uh, PvP that's going on out there that really does hamper the ability to farm, or do you think farming is still something that's really strong inside of action work? I think it's strong, not nearly as strong as it used to be. The frontline system has done a great job of making it very difficult for farmers to do their thing in the places where it would bother the folks in faction warfare that are actually doing the pvp part so i think that's been been really good actually um yeah i i think the balance is great right now with the frontline system and sort of the dynamic that it drives in terms of farmers versus actual pvpers yeah it's one thing that uh well one thing that i find has been kind of interesting is seeing a lot of people doing command operation systems actually offensive command operation systems seeing the Keldari actually flexing with large groups of people um like i've uh, just recently when i went over to um so that's you know just before we came on here we were running around in the southern area and i'll pull it up here so devon is a command operation center um it is currently 29 point three percent contested there is no really good way of getting advantage it seems like 
one way or the other for that right now, uh, for that system. But I, when I came into there today, I think there was something like 10 or like 7 Keldari that were in system out plexing. Um, one of the, they were in like a small plex with like majority of their ships were all in one plex. And I'm like, what, what is going on here? Uh, I was just wondering if you have any kind of insight into why you would want to attack a command operations center instead of going to the front line. Sure. Um, so for our, for previous to our contract against test, we set ourselves a goal of flipping the system of Halonin. It was a rear guard system in between Endeluri and Hikoken. It's not a direct route to anywhere going conventionally, but if you use a cap ship, it is the midpoint to have between Vlil and Hadeles, so it would have created a cap ship superhighway for the Galenti militia. So I was quite keen for us to capture it. No one else was really on board with it, so we just wound up doing it ourselves. Capturing a rear guard system you might want to do it for strategic reasons like that. It is extremely difficult to do. You don't get any of the supply cache spawns that help drive your advantage up. You only get so many plexes at a time. It's pretty much like the old plex cycling system. So you'll get a small, you'll get a scout, you'll get a medium, you'll get a large. There won't be any advanced. And they'll regenerate every like 30 minutes, I think it is. And that's pretty much all you have. So it's very slow going, the LP payouts are not great. But you can make progress, and we did. We got it to about 60 something percentage. And then the front lines in Oinasik and Pinacasto Hikoken got close enough that it transitioned to a command operations system. And it was like the dam burst forth. All of a sudden we were getting caches we could hit. All of a sudden we were getting a much larger array of spawns and more frequently. It wasn't as much as a front line, but it was very, very close. So I think the difference between a command operation and a front line is not as far as people may think it is. Obviously one of the biggest challenges is you can't dock there. So you will have mm -hmm. to have some other kind of either staging in the front line next door and, and making sure that you can come back and forth to reship or do what we did, which is have a player owned starbase, a POS, which gives you a secure space to store ships and switch ships without actually requiring you to dock. Oh, that's interesting. The use of, of passes coming back for, for backline yeah. systems makes a lot of sense. It's got a unique role because it, it doesn't actually utilize the docking mechanics, so you can put it in any faction warfare system to give yourself a forward operating base. No penalties. Yeah, and uh, I know that command operation systems also give you just 100% pay payout, I believe it's 150%. For frontline systems, so you get less LP, but not at you know it's not it's still LP, pretty solid amount of LP that you're going to be getting um, comparatively to like the backline systems that give you almost nothing. Right? I mean, we're not really doing it for the LP payouts, right? You're if you're going to attack a rear guard or a command operations, you're doing it for some reason other than making money. It's never going to be valuable compared to a frontline. Might be quieter, might make sense for farmers that don't want to be bothered. That's one thing that I was wondering was, is it is this like something that's being done by farmers to a certain degree because it might be a much quieter system uh, comparatively, but even then, I mean, as soon as you see that there's, you know, multiple Keldari in the system, it's easy to descan, you know, flexes. It's hard to keep yourself hidden in faction warfare that, you know, um, I feel like when the war zone was a hundred, you know, systems or so that you could go, you could hide very easily in, inside of um, an offensive plex, um, and the that was almost the only reason why it sucked to be winning the war zone, is that you couldn't hide yourself as much when you're trying to do offensive plexing, and of course, de defensive plexing sucks um, with the amount of LP that you're actually getting out of it. Um, and if you controlled the entire war zone, the Galente had, you know, the ability to, uh, or the loser would, uh, the person that's losing the war would be able to have, you know, just a slate of systems that they could go out and go, go hide away in, and that it would be much more unlikely for somebody to come and attack you. But I feel like just completing one plex now is 
it, it it's it's a coin flip whether especially depending on where you're at the more heated the zone is um but it feels like almost every frontline system right now is pretty well heated um you, you go in and you almost always see like some of the enemy and some of your people on your side depending on the time zone i think sometimes time zones can really kind of flip that um I know that sometimes in deep U.S. or Aussie time zone, you can go over to like the Nega area, uh, Nega Menon and Hasmachala area, and it's a little bit quieter for the Keldari. Uh, but then in the EU time zone, it's like, okay, there's a whole bunch of them here. Yeah, in fact, I think the only thing CCP could possibly do to, to better facilitate fighting in the front lines is to give you a better indication of whether or not the ship inside the Plex is friendly to you or not. Some sort of visual indicator or... I don't know how they like exactly work it. I guess you could do... Um, so they've got those structures on the outside of the, the warp in uh, the acceleration gate, right? If you put yeah. who's conquering that... Uh, that who's trying to capture that Plex, whether it's a Galente person or a Keldari person. So you, you warp in, you see a bunch of Keldari signs, you know, up that basically has these, like, hollow images of this, you know, the Keldari are capturing this. And if nobody's capturing it, then it's, it's you know, that those aren't up at all. would be the only thing yeah. that I could think of. But even that would be great. Uh, at the moment, unless you are in comms with everyone that's active in the system, which is unlikely for a feature like Faction Warfare. You know, you waste a lot of time warping to plexes with ships in them, only to find out there's ships on your side. I hate that. You kind of awkwardly stand around <laughs> and, then, and then move. Uh, you know, it's, it's a very minor thing, but it would really facilitate those front lines being a source of conflict, where if you're looking for that conflict, it's a lot easier to find within the system itself. Yeah, no, I fully agree fully agree um so let's just uh take a look here um at what do we have for the frontline systems and where everybody is right now um because i think that's one thing that i kind of want to do every episode is just kind of give a nice little just update as to where the different frontline systems are and uh what their contested level is so we'll start over in uh Hazmajala right here um so Hazmajala is owned by the uh, keldari the Galente have a very minor 4% advantage right now in that system, and the advantage is not being pushed very hard in that system by the Kaldari or the Galente right now. Um, something that is kind of rare over in the uh, Amar Mimitar war zone, where they seem to every one of their frontline systems is like they're both pushing 100%. Um, which, real quick, I guess as a quick diversion here, how do you feel about the advantage system and the ability to cap it out? So that if you get it, if Keldari get it to 100 and we get it to 100, it just stays at zero. And there's no way, besides reducing the enemies um, through the, what is it, propaganda? Um, listening posts. Is, is, right? Listening posts and the supply caches that spawn. And the supply caches, caches will, will actually remove the enemies? Yeah. Okay. I like it. Um... I think it. I mean, I, th I think the way to change it, would change the rate, be just adjusting the base values, and understanding where they will cap out makes balancing the feature a lot easier. Um, yeah, I I like it. I think as both sides get more used to the advantage system and understand how important it is, and I like that CCP is making changes to keep it important and make it more important. It gives you some open area PvP conflict points outside of the plexes. And I, th I think as both groups get more familiar with advantage and how important it is, I think you'll see more con contests over advantage points in particular and not just have conflict over the plexes themselves. I think one thing that they could do, give your caches, depots, whatever they are, the on your side, give friendly players a way to complete those somehow not necessarily mm -hmm. giving you any reward for it but, but just to get rid of it off. yes exactly because at the moment as far as i know they just stay there until they're killed 
and there's yeah. no incentive to sit there and defend it, and I think there really should be. Absolutely. No, I agree with that 100%. Something where even if you, like, you arrive on grid, and if you stay there for 15 minutes on grid or something, that it'll, it'll eventually make it despawn. You know, something like yeah. that. Or maybe um, some system-wide notifications when one of them is under fire, so people know that a fight is happening, or could happen. Could be helpful. Alright, so Hazmajala we've got here is 10% contested, controlled by the Keldari, um, and has been something that I believe we have owned since the uh, the flip over. That the Hazmajala, Seria, Negamenin, Sujarento have all been very strong fighting points for the Galente and Keldari. Um, so that's a this is a really good system to find some good fights. Um, this is where I normally run over to uh, if I want to hook up with the Galente, and I know that the Galente have been doing quite a bit over in the Negamenin area. Um, and so Negamenon is owned by the Galente. We currently have a 60% uh, advantage in that system. So the Keldari only have 14% uh, of their objectives and 20% from neighboring systems. And the Galente are getting 20% from neighboring systems and we have completed 74% of our objectives, almost capping out that and really pushing our advantage in that system. So we've been able to actually hold that. I know that it's been higher than 44% by quite a bit, um, and we've, we've taken that back quite a bit, and it's been back and forth between the two. Um, but it is at currently 44% contested. Um, so the Galente are trying to hold on to that, I know, very strongly, because it gives us really a good buffer between, um, you know, Devin and Fliet and keeping us fighting over in the Hazmajala area. Yeah, that's uh, a hot spot that I'm looking at, certainly. Ooh, got a... Somebody's hot mic I'm pretty hard. Oh, is that me? I have no idea. <laughs> um, Probably would Yeah, be. Hazmi is... Uh, it's a front line. It was recently recaptured by Keldari. It's not very strategically important, because it borders up against a forever frontline system and yeah, doesn't really have any strategic value. Naga is really important for us to defend though and, and we've got a structure in Naga as well. Yeah, Master I mean it's House. a four gate system. It it controls a lot. If that falls, Devin and Oto are both frontline. Hazmi and Sujarento are both secured. So it's a pivotal point in the war zone yeah. in that area. Um, so then there's Sujarento, and this is a pirate-owned system. I know that Snuff has a lot of activity here, as well as, I believe, Shadow Cartel, um, and a lot of other pirating organizations that, uh, that kind of hang out in the Sujarento Tama area. Um, this is currently controlled by the Kaldari, but was controlled by the Galente not too long ago. Uh, we, had, we had been able to take it, and from what I hear, as soon as we took it, it kind of quickly went right back into the control of the Galente, or the Kaldari, and a lot of that has to do with, uh, from my, my understanding, is the, the connections that there are with pirates in the area as well. Um, currently it is 14.2% uh, 14 contested. There is a 19% advantage to the Kaldari currently, and um, is kind of a, a gated system for how um, how much you're going to be able to control like Tama, Adeno, uh, Aranako, Talonin, um, because if you don't control Sujarento it's really hard to control those as well. Um, Talonin's an interesting uh, frontline system. It's contr currently controlled by the Kaldari, but it borders a Galente-owned Pisec system. Yeah, Tirjev. Yeah, with Tirjev, um, it makes it so that it, it's always going to be a frontline system if the Keldari own it. Um, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of, of push from what I've been seeing to really take Talon in. Um, and then Tama was a frontline system for a little while. I was kind of excited when it got frontline system. I was able to actually extract some asset safety um, from the, the 
structures that had been blown up in Tama um, recently, but I was surprised to see how dead Tama is. Tama, yeah, the death of Space Detroit really took a lot out of the uh, the community that lived in Tama. Just hasn't been the same since. Yeah, and it's it's not um, it's not even pi- or like there isn't really even any pirates there anymore. It's, you know, it's not a frontline system, and even when it became a frontline system, there just wasn't a lot of fighting that was happening there from either side. Um, I was a little disappointed in that. I just, I, I, I loved Tama back when it was like in the heyday of PvP, and now like sometimes it struggles to get 20 people in that system. When you know you would be having like 30, 40, 50 people easily punching each other, small fleets running around everywhere, lots of solo. <laughs> Uh, but that just seems to have calmed down quite a bit. Um, Nissawa is another one that's interesting. I really, I really want Nissawa to fall uh, because our old ancestral home is Notorious. We've moved out of Notorious, so that has caused um, the, you know, a lot of our assets are stuck there right now, and it's a command operation system, so we can't dock it anything except for a pod and undock with anything except for a pod and player owned stations that we have a lot of our stuff in and then the NPC stations that we have a lot of stuff in is, is locked away um, but this has been a fight that's been going on for a long time and it's barely really moved the needle it is at 38.2% um, contested right now with an 8% advantage going to the Keldari there's good fights I think to be had there been been a lot of good fighting um, that we've been having um, alongside with the Onasekin, which is controlled by the Galente. We've got a 58% advantage right now in that system, and the system is 56.3% contested, and has gotten up to like the 90s, if I remember correctly. Um, that was a really heavily contested system, and we've kind of pulled it back from the brink. Um, and that's an interesting system because it's kind of like the gateway over to Pinecasto or Nisawa, you know, depending on which way that you kind of want to go. If you want to go back over and kind of do the loop back around, um, or if you want to go north. Um, and doesn't have any stations um, in it, except, f and I don't even think there's any player-owned stations, if I remember. Yeah, no, there's no player-owned stations for the Galente in that system either. Um, so it's a little bit harder to attack and defend uh, because you just there's no, nowhere to, to store any of your stuff currently. Um, then we've got uh, Pinecasto, which used to be owned by the Galente and recently have kind of has fallen back into the Kaldari's hands. Um, so this has traded hands a couple of times. Um, it's currently 42.3% contested with a 7% advantage going to, to the Kaldari. And that's an interesting one because as soon as you, if the Galente control that, then that makes Rakpuspus, Kiri, um, Hakukin all become frontline systems. Um, and I, I can see why that's something that does not want to be pushed by, uh, or doesn't want to be, the Kaldari don't want us owning that. And as soon as we took it, I, I know that there was a concentrated effort, and like you said, I think there was help from Snuff to be like, no, this has got to be a Kaldari system. Uh, then we've got Nenemelia, which is a stronghold of the Kaldari. 1.5% um, contested. You can kind of see if it is a stronghold of a frontline system that's a stronghold, will be no, con it won't be contested. <laughs> you know, like, they're going to ensure that that uh, contested level stays low by the people that are living there. Nenemelia normally has a very strong contingent of um, Kaldari that are in system. Um, and I like to use this as a system to find fights in, because you know that there's not going to be much Galente backup, um, and you'll have a lot of solo stuff that'll be kind of going on, or small gang stuff that can kind of go on. If you penetrate into that, they're aware of it, they're going to they're gonna announce it to people and they're going to try out and come out and kill you. Um, so if I'm not looking for any LP and I just want to look for a fight, Nenemelia is a good place to go. And historically, it used to be one of the strongest bastions of, of strength for the, Kelda, or for the Galente back when it actually um, 
uh, Akadagi used to connect to Hisek before uh, uh, the Triglavian takeover of those systems. And so this was like a really good place to, to like set yourself up so that you could, you know, set up gate camps in Akadagi on the uh, high sec gate and was able to kill stuff. And this was uh, with only one sister, one station in this system. It was really, really good spot to uh, set yourself up. And it's got like huge warps, like hundred some odd AU warps that you have to do, um, which is always interesting. Well, I'm speaking of interesting, we've got an interesting fight coming up, and I've got a drop to attend. Oh yeah, not a problem. We we're just about to finish up here, so I'll just run through a couple of these others. Thank you, Alex, so much for coming on. Always good to hear from you. Um, Thanks for having me, Frozen. This was a lot of fun. Have a good one. Bye bye. Right, and we've got uh, Aldrinetti, which is uh, seventy-six point eight percent contested. Um, this is something that uh, the Galente definitely want to keep, the Keldari definitely want to take down, and is um, currently underneath the control of the Galente. 5% um, advantage though of for the Keldari, and advantage is being fought over quite partially, um, quite a bit of uh, work that's being put into that they have. 84 or 94% for the Kaldari, 89% uh, for the Galente in the amount of advantage that we have. The net gain then of 5% for the Kaldari. Um, Evelyn, which I don't think is really being pushed very hard by one side or the other, you can tell kind of by the uh, uh, amount of advantage. Right, right now, the um, Galente have a minor 3% overall with 13% amount of advantage currently, and the Kaldari haven't done anything but just had the neighboring systems that are helping and giving them 10% there. But it is 50.7% contested, and that would be the the gateway into the, uh, into the constellation that we were all fighting over, um, or trying to fight over, which Galente didn't really push too much. Um, to try and take this constellation over by Richard and uh, um, Athenon. Um, so then there's Vivalier, which is only 2.0% contested. It is a frontline system. It is a stronghold of the uh, Galente. So very, it's going to be very hard for the Keldari to take that without a full-on, you know, months-long campaign in order to try and hold that down. OICX had recently just fallen to the Kaldari, and the Galente are pushing advantage right now. We've got a total of 26% advantage um, net gain for the Galente right now, and it is 27.1% contested. All right, so I think uh, other than that, is there anything that you wanted to talk about at all, Nightflyer, before we uh, head out here? No, I think I wrapped that up. Like I said, I was still trying to work out my logistics for that uh, battle cry that uh, Alex just got why he had to take off. Like I said, all my stuff is way out of position. Um, big problem with uh, my logistics, moving stuff around, is having the right ship where I need it, when I need it. So that's what I've been working on in the background here. I do apologize. but Yeah, no, uh, not a thanks problem. Thanks a lot, Frozen. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for getting Alec to come on and uh, reaching out for us, getting that all organized for us. And uh, thank you all for watching. If you're interested in joining up with the war effort, go ahead and put an application into Golden Age Stories in-game, or you could do Noir as well, um, and uh, uh, the network. Um, if you want to watch us live on Twitch, you can do that every Sunday at 2300 Eve time, that's 5 p.m. Central time. And if you missed the show live, you can always watch us on our, or listen or watch us on our podcast, Federation Frontline Report. Um, you can get that on Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, um, and pretty much any podcasting platform that is out there. You can check out our new website, uh, federationfrontline.com, if you want to know more information about our alliance, as well as our organization, um, you know, podcast that we kind of put out. We have all of our podcast stuff on there as well. Um, and 
If you have news that you'd like us to talk about on the show or you'd like to be a guest or you have an after action report that you want us to talk about, um, go ahead and send an email to Frozen Fallout in game and uh, we'll be more than happy to discuss that on the show here. Have a good night. Good night, everybody. <laughs>